15, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through verse 15. We're going to talk about the study of God's Word. The study of God's Word. Now, I don't uh, come into your home. I don't know a lot about your personal life. I don't know how much you study the Bible. I don't know how many times you pull it down a day and read it. Um, and I hope we do more than just read. Now, I love to just read of a morning. I love to just just read. And uh, what I usually do, as I've told you before, is I go through the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. One chapter in the Old Testament, one chapter in the New Testament, and just read. But then I set aside another time of the day to take a book and just take my time and go through the study of that chapter. Then I'll pull down every book I have on that book and on that chapter, and I'll read it. And I will uh, go through that. I've done that for several years, and it has really blessed me, and it's enhanced uh, my study. And uh, so uh, pray for us as we uh, go through uh, this uh, work. Oh, it's good to see David back. I forgot to say that. He was feeling sick on last Sunday. He looks a whole lot better today. Of course, I didn't see him, but he looks better today. Good to see you, young man. We thank the Lord that you are up there. <clears throat> uh, reading is important. Reading in the Bible is important. But you need to read after other men. You ladies have some lady writers that you read after, and, uh, but there are some men that just know how to say it. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon was one of them. I have as many books by Hart Charles Spurgeon as I can. He knew what he was doing. And in a wicked place, God used him to start a church and did this, some tremendous work there in London. And in this particular chapter that I'm reading, uh, he's talking about preachers. And he's talking about the congregation. And... Um, I, like to, I just like what he says. Uh, for instance, he says this. He says, when a blanket wraps around the day, when the rotten woodland drips and the leaf is stamped in clay, and then he says that's the time to get on your knees, your bedside, whatever, and end that day with prayer, thanking the Lord for what he had done for you that day. Name the things that he has done for you that day. I don't have time to read all of this. Um, but he's talking about some preachers who are very melancholy about the way they serve the Lord. A lot of Christians are just melancholy in the way they come to church. You'll agree with me on that, won't you? Uh, why is it that in the lives of many believers, Sunday night is just not an option? Wednesday night is just not an option? I don't understand that. I, I don't know that. I don't understand that. Uh, I've been preaching a lot of years. I've been saved a lot of years. I still need my time alone with the Lord. I still need to listen to other men preach. When I'm going somewhere, I have uh, my radio on listening to preachers. Uh, I take notes from other pastors. I try to read uh, from the best men, the best writers. Uh, I, what I'm simply saying is this. Uh, we, if we want to have a, a ministry that God's going to bless, we need to really uh, put the Lord first. And uh, he says this in, in this chapter. He's talking about the disciples. He says, Our Lord, sending out his disciples two by two, manifested that he knew what was in man. But for such a man as Paul, it seemed to me that no helpmate was found. You know what he's saying? He's saying that man was one of a kind. He was one of a kind. I wish God would give us one of those men today. I'm leaving that up to God. I, I'm not God. I'm leaving that up to him. But it seems like we have a drought in great men these days. Now, there's a lot of great men out there and great women. And so Spurgeon makes that statement. He knew what was in man. But for such a man as Paul, it seemed to me that no helpmate was found. Barnabas or Silas or Luke were hills too low 
to hold a high converse with such a Himalayan summit as the apostle of the Gentiles. Now that's Charles Haddon Spurgeon talking, talking about Paul. Now, I read that and I thought this. Do I, do I aspire to be like that? Do I aspire to do that? Do I want that in my life? How many preachers, how many pastors want that kind of a life for God? I talk to a lot of men, and I don't really see that uh, in their life. Let me read just a little more. He says here, this loneliness, talking about Paul, this loneliness which, if I mistake, not to be felt by many of my brethren, it is fertile source of desperation, and our ministers, fraternal meeting, and the cultivation of the holy intercourse with kindred minds, minds of will, with God's blessing, help us greatly to escape the snare. Now, I said all of that and read all of that. Now, here is the title of the book. What would you think the title of this book would be after listening to what I said? Here's the title of the book. When a preacher is downcast. When a preacher is downcast. And you know in this book Spurgeon talks about himself being downcast? Paul was downcast at times and, he, he, and Spurgeon said there are times, many times, and I've read his life. And there were times that his wife had to just force him and his deacons just forced him to leave the pulpit and take a week, two weeks off and go to the sea and just spend time on the sea. You say, well, what does all that have to do with uh, what we're looking at here? Well, we need, if we're going to do anything for God, we need to know how to live for God. Well, how do you find out how to live for God? Do you want to please him tonight? Well, I do. Well, how do you find out what pleases him? You read his word, amen? You study his word. And there is a drought of men and women in this country who wants to know the word. I see people, I, it, it amazes me. I see people, and uh, they were out of church, and I would see them on the street, and I would say, I missed you on Sunday. And they would make some statement and so forth. They were sick or whatever. And it really uh, set me back when I'd see some of their kids, and I would say, you know, your mom and dad were out of church Sunday, and you were too. And they said that, and I just wondered uh, if you all were sick. And then they gave a very different uh, description of what happened. Very different description of what happened. Do you believe those kind of folk will answer the Lord for that at the judgment seat? I do. I do. Now I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I just want us to be wide open in our, in our eyesight, in our spiritual eyesight, and watching that we study the scriptures, that we'll know how to rightly divide the word. All right, Paul is talking here, speaking, and he's talking about the path of a good soldier here in chapter 2. The path of a good soldier. Now, I've got to admit, I'm not always a good soldier. I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. There are times I'm just not a good soldier. There are things that upset me. There are things about people that upset me, church members uh, that, uh, that upset me. There's only one here tonight that does. I'm joking. I'm joking. Lou, I'm joking. I honestly, I'm joking there. But yeah, honestly, you'll, if you'll have to admit tonight, you'll have to admit that life's not always easy and sometimes, sometimes you get set back, don't you? You get set back and you get discouraged and then you start shaking around. You don't know what to do. Well, that's when you come back to the scripture. Amen? Come back to the scripture. On your knees in prayer and come back to the scripture. Now, it, Paul was a soldier, wasn't he? Timmy was a, Timothy was a soldier. All right, let's begin reading verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul was interested in this young man and he wanted to see him succeed in a great way. And this young man had his ups and downs, uh, but he was a helpmeet to the Apostle Paul. And Paul called him my son and he wanted him to be strong. Now verse 2, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men. 
I have that, uh, those two words, faithful men, underscored in, in the Bible, faithful men. I want to ask you tonight to begin to pray, if you've not, that God would send us some faithful men, more faithful men into our church. And then to pray that it help us men that are here to be faithful. But pray that God will give us some faithful men, because we have faithful men here. We do, faithful men, good men. And I thank God for it. And so Paul is so concerned about that. And um, he says, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now here comes the hard part. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him <clears throat> who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now that's a very uh, powerful two verses, isn't it? Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. How many Christians do you know that's willing to endure hardness? You know, you look at churches today. Sometimes Sue and I, will, we, we have faithful preachers that we watch just about every night. We'd love to listen to them. They rightly divide the word of truth. The men that have been preaching for years, and God's used them uh, mightily. And then just for knowledge's sake, we'll turn to some of the other preachers. And all it is is a hollabaloo. 45 minutes to an hour of screaming and yelling and jumping over benches and singing songs that sounds like that they're uh, out in the, out in the uh, jungle somewhere uh, with the old-fashioned uh, people out there screaming and yelling. And then about 15 minutes of shallow preaching. And that's about it. The Bible says preach the word. Be in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come. I believe it's here, don't you? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And so he's warning his people here. And he says again in verse 4, No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. If a man also strive for masteries, yet he is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partakers of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to, the, to, to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus for eternal glory. It is a faithful saying, for if you be dead with him, we will also live with him. Isn't that a great thought? Now, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now verse 14 and 15. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. Isn't that an amazing statement? I love that. Verse 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit but to subverting of the hearers. Now here we are. Study to show thyself approved uh, unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now that's a great verse. But I want to read verse 16 because look what he says in verse 16 to warn us and to tell us what to do. But shun, there are some people to shun, profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, 
Isn't that something? I read that and I just think about that. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Now, you can see here how important it is in Paul's mind to study the scriptures. Remember when he was in jail, he told Timothy, when you come, bring this and that, but especially the parchments. That's the Old Testament scriptures. But especially the parchment. The scriptures that he had. Now, he didn't have the Old and the New Testament like we do. He had some of the Old, some of the Old Testament, etc. But he said, I want them. That's more important. More important than anything. Bring the parchments. Bring me God's word. And what he was saying is, it's very, very important important. Now, if you're a Bible student, and I pray that you are, and I feel that you are, it is paramount for you and I to aim as a Bible student, as a Bible student, that we learn the will of God by reading and studying the Word of God. A few weeks ago, I think I asked the question, are you in God's will for your life right now? Are you in God's will for your life right now? And so here's Paul in prison, but still in the will of God. And he's concerned for Timothy. And he's saying, Timothy, you study. You keep on studying. And not merely just a, a glaze over the scriptures, but an, uh, take an academic interest. An academic interest. I'll never forget my first day as a freshman at Tennessee Temple Bible School. I had been there visiting many times, of course, and I'd set in some of the classes. But um, I wasn't ready for what I was going to find that day. Dr. Robert Burdett, who was the dean of the Bible school, he was our teacher, and he was teaching homiletics. And he said, gentlemen, now take your homiletic books and turn to page such and such. And he, we're going to study today the art of preaching. And he starts out. And by the time I get about 15 to 20 minutes into it, I said, what? What am I doing here? You know what I discovered? If you're going to do anything, you're going to have to put effort into it. And don't be a quitter. Don't give up. And so I sat there and I thought, I sat there and I thought, and I said, no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm not quitting. And I stayed there. And I'm glad that I did. I'm glad that I did. I'm thanking God uh, that I did. We want the scriptures to be our supreme guide for our life, don't we? We want the scriptures to be the supreme guide for our life. And it behooves every Christian to make a serious effort to master the Word of God. Now, let me suggest that you do, I would suggest that if you could do this, do it like I do. Take, just take an Old Testament book, Genesis. I just start in Genesis, take a chapter, stay in that chapter until it comes plain to you. So many things come plain. Then pull you down a study book or whatever and that's on the book of Genesis and read that. Then go to Matthew and do the same thing in Matthew. And you just keep doing that. You go through the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second, Samuel, etc. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and so forth. By the time you get through the Old Testament and the New Testament, you know what you're going to do? You're going to sit back and you're going to say, boy, that was rough. But I did it, and I thank God I did because I know the Scriptures so much better. If you find yourself in a real mess, you know, I don't know how many times as a pastor I've had men and women come into my office with tears, and they would sit down, and usually the woman would be the one that would speak first. He hardly wouldn't speak unless you draw it out of him. And she'd say something like this, Preacher, I've been married to this man for blah, 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 so many years. We had a great life up until a year ago. And so she started 
talking about what was going on. And he just sat there. And I said, now you two are believers. Yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. You've been saved for a long time. Yes, sir. You've been attending this church for a while. Yes, sir. And I said, do you read and study your Bible together every day? And a frown come on both of their faces. No, sir. How much time do you spend? Very little. What about your children? Are you teaching them? Are they reading this? No. And so I just looked at them and I said, Duel, you've learned a lot just by what you just said, haven't you? You're not giving God any time in your life. You're not memorizing the scriptures. You're not living it out. And it took a little while in counseling, but they began to come back to church and be more faithful. And then they began to study the scriptures, and they began to grow then. And so it's imperative, it's just imperative that we need to be able to master the contents of the scripture. Now, you know that they, are, they really are sacred scriptures because it's God's word, amen? Sacred scriptures. Now, I've got uh, seven things I want to say, and it'll take us a little time, maybe three weeks to get through it, but we don't need to be in any hurry. Uh, but yeah, I'm going to give you some notes. Number one, write down, God's word should be studied. God's word should be studied with reverence. Reverence. Now, I don't mean, by that I don't mean this. I had a man come up to me one day and he handed me his Bible. He said, I want you to look at my Bible. I picked it up and I looked at it and I went all the way through it and there was no markings at all. There's nothing there. And I said, well, that's, it's a good Bible. What, what do you, why do you want me to look at it? He said, well, I just wanted to show you my Bible. I take it with me everywhere I go. Now, sometimes I just jump right in there. And I said, you mean to tell me that uh, you claim to be a great Christian, but you don't read your Bible, you just carry it with you? Well, yeah, yeah. And so I said, sir, you have a lot to learn. Do you know what 2 Timothy 2.15 says? And he said, no. And I said, the Bible says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, he thought that he was reverencing the Bible just because he was carrying it. Now, I keep a Bible in the car. I do that. I want it, I want it to be there. And uh, sometimes I make sure that when I go in the mall, I'll have my little New Testament uh, in my back pocket. Today, I was over there for my, uh, for my walk. And uh, I was going down, as I always do. I'm looking for people that, you know, if they're walking in a hurry, I don't stop them. But if they're just standing around, I'll walk up to them and I'll say, uh, how are you doing today, sir? And yes, and blah, 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 and all, all of that. And I'll say to them, I'm pastor of Gospel Light Baptist Church up here. And I'd like to give you one of our tracks, and I'd like to invite you to our church. And they'll say, well, I go to church. Well, where do you go? And they name the church, they name the pastor, and it seems to me, yeah, they really do. They really do. And so I'll say to them, would you keep that and pray for us? And they say, y'all, absolutely. Absolutely. Went on around, and there was a young man standing there. And uh, I noticed that he had on a, a clemson hat. And so I said, immediately, he needs God. Some of you are not football fans. You didn't get that. Uh, you will one of these days. Well, anyway, I walked up to him and I said, so you're a Clemson fan? He said, I see you're a Tennessee fan. And so we went at each other for a little bit, you know. And uh, so uh, I said to him, sir, if you died today, do you know you'd go to heaven? He said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I said, could you tell me how you know? And he had a, uh, he had a Bible with him and uh, had the right answer. That just, that just thrilled me. That, that just thrilled me to, to know that, that he did go to church and he loved the Lord and he uh, has a girlfriend. They're thinking about getting married. And he said, we want to grow up in church or bring our kids up in, up in church and so forth and so on. And that was a, that was a real thrill. But uh, last week there was a man standing there and it looked sort of like he was down and out sad, and I walked up to him and talked to him, did the same thing, gave him the scriptures, and then I said, sir, if you died today, do you know you would go to heaven? And he said, no. He said, I don't really think anybody can know that. And I said, well, if I could take the Bible and show you how you could be saved, and 
and you would know it. Would you allow me to do so? No, I don't. I don't think I need to do that. I, uh, if that, that's that's a that's a private thing between me and God. I don't need somebody involved in this, you know. And so he's really got all riled up. And so I said, Well, sir, if you would just take the track, and if you get time, just read it. I said, Will you do that? And he said, I will. You meet all kinds. You meet all kinds. And that mall down there has just got people that you can have an opportunity to give out a track to and, and witness to. And so uh, we want to reverence the Word of God. Now, if we reverence it, then we'll want to use it to help other people, won't we? We want to reverence the Word of God. Now, listen to what Hebrew says over in chapter 12, verse 28 and 29. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved... Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Well, that's a powerful verse, isn't it? It ought to be a powerful verse. Now, I know I'm speaking to the choir. I'm preaching to the choir tonight. I know that. But if I can help you in any way to get some things that maybe enhance your walk with the Lord, that'll help you to reach out for your family and others, uh, I want to. I want to be able uh, to do that. And so we see from these verses that God wants us to reverence His Word. Um, Wayne Williams. I learned a lot from Wayne Williams. I mean, a lot from Wayne Williams. Uh, we picked up his brother, uh, John, at the airport uh, in Chattanooga, and he was going to come up to Dayton, and he was going to spend some time uh, with us. And so he got in the car, and he put his stuff in the, in the trunk and so forth and, and so on, and he had his Bible in his hand. And because he was Wayne's brother, I said, you sit up front with Wayne. And so we're going down, and he gets in, and he takes his Bible, and he just throws it in the back seat. Wayne moves over to the side of the road. Young man, don't you ever do that again. In my sight or out of my sight. But what? That's not. He said, you handle God's word with reverence. Now, I was younger than him at that time, just sort of starting out. That did something to me that day. Now, I, I always treated God's word with reverence. My mother had one of these old big family Bibles. You remember the old big family Bibles? And you'd put the names of everybody in it. And I mean, it was an heirloom. Every, you know, when they passed it down, they passed it down. You know, what I'm, you know what I'm talking about? And so I would watch my mother. She would pick up that big Bible every day, three times a day, and she'd set that big Bible on her lap, and she would read it for 30 minutes or an hour. And my grandmother would do the same thing. Now, they were not perfect women. But they read the Bible. And I learned from them and from my pastor to reverence the Word of God. Now look at what this verse says again. Wherefore, we receiving the kingdom which cannot be moved. Aren't you glad that we're into something that's going to last? Um, I worked uh, when I was going to college. I, I worked starting out going to, to uh, working at Oster Manufacturing Company. Some of you may remember them. They're, they were up in the uh, Milwaukee area uh, up there, and they were count opener housings and, and all of that. And so um, I was working there and going to church as well. And so while I was there, I took my New Testament with me. And uh, at lunch, I'd take the New Testament out, and, and I would read it. Now, I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just simply saying that's what I did. And I would have people come up to me and say, what are you reading? And I'm saying, I'm reading my Bible. Well, why are you reading it today? Can't you wait till you get home? And I would say, I need this book every day as much as I can read it. And then I'd have an opportunity to witness. When men and women see you reverencing the Bible... And when our children see us reverencing the Bible, it'll make a difference in their heart and in their life. Do you agree with me? And I don't have to preach to the choir again. I know exactly uh, what you're saying, what I'm saying. Number two, and we'll probably stop right there. The second thing, God's Word should be studied with prayerfulness. We ought to reverence it, but we ought to study it with prayerfulness. I don't open my Bible uh, in my study until I first of all take time to pray. 
when I'm alone in the here uh, and I'm alone in my study, or if I'm not alone in my study, before I go through my regular reading, I'll get on my knees I'll, at my big chair there, and I'll pray. I'll pray for you folks, and I'll pray for the members of the church, and pray for those that are sick, and pray for our situation in the world, and, and on and on. Start off my day that way, and I try to do that at least two or three times a day. But... I asked the Lord to help me as I study his word that day. I did that this morning. I'll do that in the morning, God willing, unless we're in heaven and it'll be okay. Amen. But here's the verse that I want you to look at. Open thou mine eyes. Now, this is from the second point. God's word should be studied with prayerfulness. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy Law. That's first, or that's Psalm 119, 18. Write down John 20, 2 20 as a parallel verse. John 2 and verse, first John 2, verse 20. And then this one for in Isaiah, Psalm, sorry, Psalm 119, 18. Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And I know you've done this. I know you've done this. You're tired and you really want to rest, you really want to get to bed, but you know you've got to study the Bible. You've got to. So you sit down, and you open it, and you start reading, and you almost stop, but you keep on going. And all of a sudden, pow! Out of the Scriptures comes something that you had been wanting an answer to, a question that you wanted the answer to. There it is. There it is. That's the way God works. That's the way the Holy Spirit works. If we study God's Word, and if we reverence God's Word, and if we study it with prayerfulness. Now, next week we'll talk about God's Word should be studied with diligence, and God's Word should be studied by meekness. We'll look at that and some others. Now, several people in our church need our prayers. Several people in our church need our prayers. We went over a few of those, and so we need to be praying for them. Do that tonight before you go to bed. And then when you wake up in the morning, will you do the same thing? Pray that God will heal the sick, claim the, reclaim the backslidden, save the lost, and bless our church in a way it has never been blessed before. Let's stand, and we'll be dismissed in prayer. And let's be much in prayer for one another as we move forward for the glory of God. Father, I thank you for men like Spurgeon, Calvin, and just on and on, Billy Sunday. Lord, those men, you use them to turn the world upside down. We may not get to that point that they have come to, but there's a lot of folk in this church that need help. There's a young, there's an older couple that going through a lot of physical problems. They want to come. They call me, Pastor, I will be there Sunday. And then they'll call me back and say, this happened, and they kind of can't come. Lord, that young couple that have no children, he's saved, but she's not. And she came to me Sundays a week ago and said, Pastor, I need to sit down and talk to you about this matter of salvation. And they're trying to set a time to come and meet. Lord, I pray that you'll prepare her heart. I pray that you'll prepare my heart so we can go through the scriptures and help her to come to that point where she'll believe and understand that she's lost and she needs Jesus as her Savior. She has some background that's going to hinder that, but the Holy Spirit can overcome anything. Now, thank you for these people that are here tonight faithful, faithful. God bless them. They're our friends, but they're our brothers and sisters in Christ. I pray that you'll be with Jesse as he goes through his studies and that you'll bless him and use him. And I pray for Tom's daughter. Uh, we prayed today for her several times today. And on and on and on we're going. We're praying for needs. And so I pray that we'll see answers to these needs. And I pray that you'll take us from where we are right now until where you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. As you